All right, we're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 9, uh, starting. We, we covered verse 18 just briefly at the end of uh, last Sunday. Um, but uh, we're going to go back over it in uh, a little more, more detail uh, this morning. And um, in chapter uh, 9, in the, uh, the beginning of it is when Jesus set, sent out the twelve. Uh, and gave them power and authority to perform miracles and to preach the message of the kingdom, the gospel to, uh, uh, to, the, to the people in the surrounding uh, cities. And uh, word had gotten out, not just about his disciples, but it was spreading about Jesus. So much so that there were rumors um, that this was John the Baptist uh, raised from the dead. And this got Peter's, I mean, excuse me, this got Herod's attention. And uh, Herod had uh, desired to see Jesus, but never actually sent for him. But there was all these rumors floating around and, and uh, that Jesus was uh, uh, John the Baptist resurrected or that he was Elijah or that he was another prophet that had been raised from the dead. Because they hadn't seen anything like this before, the things that Jesus was doing. Uh, after that, Jesus fed the uh, 5,000. We talked about this last Sunday. And, and uh, just one of the uh, extremely fascinating miracle that he performed. Uh, but uh, the, the biggest takeaway that I get from that story, and always have, is that um, God doesn't require or ask of you what you what's beyond your capacity what's beyond your capability to give and they didn't have much all they had was five loaves and two fish and then that, that came from a young boy we understand and uh, somehow Jesus was able to feed the 5,000 and have 12 basketfuls left over uh, an amazing uh, amazing miracle and um, but this prompted um, Jesus to ask because he was, he was gaining in popularity, but it would seem to be for the wrong reasons. Uh, we understand in John that it was after he fed them like this that they began to seek after him. And Jesus told them why they were seeking after him. It was because he fed them. And they were looking for more. They were looking for more uh, of this miraculous food. And... Uh, so they, they, he was gaining popularity, but it might have been for the wrong reasons. And in verse 18, it says, And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him, and he asked them, saying, Whom say people that I am? And this harkens back to uh, verse uh, 7 and, and uh, 8 uh, in this same chapter, where Herod heard news of what people were saying about Jesus. And it's amazing to me that it can be all these years later, uh, approximately 2,000 years later, and still uh, people aren't sure what to make of Jesus. They're not sure what to think of him, and which is astonishing to me. It should be clear and it should be very plain uh, that, that he is indeed the Son of God, that he is indeed the, the promised Messiah that, was, that had come to uh, uh, the people of Israel and um, that God had raised him from the dead. And to, you know, these things seem to be uh, historical facts that are indisputable, uh, that, that Jesus was and that he lived, that he performed these miracles. He didn't do it in some sad corner that nobody knew about. Uh, he, he did it, uh, the whole land here knew it. Even the Roman government uh, knew about it. Herod knew about it. He had wind of it. But rather than get to the bottom of things, and rather than find out who Jesus really is and what he's really about, uh, they would just continue to linger uh, uh, in the, I guess, the, uh, this indecision, so to speak, and, and not really ever get to the bottom of who Jesus was and, and what he came to do. 2,000 years later, there are people still like that. Uh, they're still indecisive. They're they, they still curious about Jesus, curious about who he is. Uh, 
but they would be more likely to pay attention to a, a ridiculous horoscope in the newspaper than they would uh, to the words of Jesus. Uh, Jesus asked this question, uh, Whom say the people that I am? And they answering said, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others say that uh, one of the old prophets is risen again. And the question that he asks next is extremely uh, important. And this is what Jesus was getting to is where, in asking the question to begin with. He says, um, but whom say ye that I am? And, and that's the important question. And Peter answering said, the Christ of God. And the Christ is, uh, means the Messiah, uh, means the anointed one of God that was sent in fulfillment of the, uh, of the, uh, the Old Testament prophecies. Um, and uh, it says, And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. Uh, I'll comment on that in just a second. But first, uh, it's important that, for one thing, it's to not be distracted by what other people think of Christ. And I think that's what Jesus was getting across to his disciples. There was all these rumors floating around. But his disciples had been with him, had seen him face to face, and knew him full well, who he was and what he was about. And but what really mattered was not what other people thought. What mattered was what do you think? What do you think of Jesus? What do you think uh, uh, of, of, of him, of who he is and, and, and what he had come to do? And the decision always comes down to that. People get wrapped up into uh, what other people will think of me uh, should I profess Christ. And, and, and uh, you, you know, they might be worried about uh, the reputation or, or some such thing as that. Uh, but everyone needs to answer that question. Who do you say that Jesus is? What do you believe about him? Who is he to you? Uh, not that that changes his nature by any means of you know uh, what Jesus is and, and what he came to do, but we everyone needs to face that question because he is indeed the Christ of God. He is indeed the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and there's no other name under heaven whereby a person is saved other than Jesus Christ. That's the, that, that's it. That's the only way. So it's important for everyone to come to terms with what do you think of Jesus. Uh, who is he to you? And, and uh, we come to church for many reasons. Among them is to encourage each other in the Lord. And uh, one of them is to, uh, uh, is to meet with the Lord, to meet uh, with him in spirit. Because the scripture tells us where uh, Jesus taught, said that where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So, uh, but, but, but among those many reasons we, that we come, we come to encourage each other. And, uh, but at the same time, I'm, I'm not living your Christian life for you, and you're not living it for me. Uh, the, what, what it all boils down to is not what you think about him or what someone else thinks about him, but what I think about him. And, and, and you have to consider what you think about him. And, and uh, we don't do this vicariously through anyone else. And what it boils down to is we hear the gospel and what is it that we do with it? Do we believe, do we trust in Christ or do we not? Um, that's, um, it doesn't even really come down to doctrine. The, the uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say doctrine because there, there is some doctrine, like the doctrine of, of uh, salvation. The, you know, the gospel itself is a doctrine. It's a teaching. So I don't, uh, but what I'm speaking of are the things that differentiate us, let's say, from other so-called Christian organizations and Christian churches. Uh, it isn't even about that. It's about your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can be right on baptism, you can be right on the Lord's Supper, you can be right on, on uh, uh, the, the, the nature and the origin of the church, you can be right on all of those things, but if you haven't if, uh, done what is proper with the Lord Jesus Christ and seek a relationship with Him and trust in Him, if He's not the center at the very core of our being, then we've got something wrong. 
we have to address the question, who is Christ to me? Is he my Lord or is he just something in the peripheral that's, that's uh, like these people were thinking? He's some prophet or he's Elijah or not really sure what he is or who he is to you. Uh, you have to be sure uh, who he is to you. And, and it says that he charged them that, he would, that they would tell no man. Well, why in the world would he do that? You would think that he would be telling them, okay, go spread that message. But the time had actually passed for uh, the fulfillment of the uh, scriptures in the way that they thought that it would happen. They were, they were in the process of rejecting the Messiah. And uh, uh, the, uh, they, you know, John the Baptist, the, the, the forerunner to Christ, uh, had himself even second thoughts while he was in jail. Uh, he was the one that introduced him to the people. He introduced Jesus to the people. And he said, this is the one. Well, now he's in, you know, later he's in jail, and then he's wondering himself. Uh, the reason he was wondering is because things weren't happening the way it appeared they should, according to Old Testament prophecy. And it, it, it made him to doubt. When the people start, started saying there's a great prophet among us, John is most likely thinking, wait a minute. Jesus is not supposed to be a, just a great prophet. He's supposed to be the Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, that, so he wanted to be sure, and he sent word to Jesus. But anyway, he, he had those doubts uh, because of the way things were happening around him. And at this moment in time, that uh, uh, Jesus wasn't wanting to spread that message, uh, that message that uh, John the Baptist that had already been rejected by the people and uh, uh, seeing what had happened to John the Baptist. But uh, the... Uh, he tells them, he says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. There was a, there was a timetable, a divine timetable that had to be observed and it wouldn't happen the way that it needed to happen had they been going around broadcasting that. If you remember when Jesus was casting out the devils, these demons, even they would start to say it and he would have to shut them up. And because and, and, he, he didn't want the testimony of demons to, 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 to be uh, uh, deliver, delivering this information to people either. But um, uh, he didn't want people to know uh, that he was making this claim uh, abroad uh, because there was a timetable, there was things and events that had to take place uh, that uh, would, might be short-circuited uh, if things... Uh, um, Things happened too soon. Uh, everything had to happen according as uh, uh, that divine timetable uh, had had uh, determined. And uh, then he goes on to chapter, uh, excuse me, verse twenty-three, and he talks about something that that uh, might seem unrelated, but it is not. It says, uh, and he said to them all. Oh, by the way, I forgot one of the most important things all the way back in 18, verse 18. It started by saying and it came to pass as he was alone praying that his disciples were with him. And that's another thing that's uh, uh, interesting about the life of Christ and about Luke's testimony of him is that he portrays Jesus as a man that was praying all of the time. And uh, uh, he would go to himself to pray he would, do, he would make no big decision if, unless he had consulted his father first. And um, this is the example that we get from Jesus, that he was always in close contact with his father. He told them, according to the uh, Gospel of John, that he didn't do anything without asking his father, and that he didn't say anything without asking his father. So it's interesting that, how that relationship is between God the Father and God the Son, and how close he was. Uh, to God and uh, understanding what God's what His Father's will is, but that's how it was done. And uh, it says that, and he uh, and he said to them all in verse twenty three, "If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it." For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory 
and in his fathers and of the holy angels. I tell you a truth, there be some standing here that shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Now, the uh, Jesus begins talking about denying yourself, taking up the cross, and following him. Now, there's a lot of things that Jesus said that we ought to do. Uh, but people confuse uh, teaching like this with the way to eternal life, the way to salvation. I don't even particularly like using the term salvation that much uh, when referring to eternal life uh, that uh, or redemption. Uh, because salvation is a broad term that can apply in many different ways. Uh, like, uh, for example, uh, church. This, the, 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 the church itself meeting here uh, you can be saved after a manner uh, by doing so. And uh, uh, even it says so in, in, in Peter, or at least it uses the analogy of the ark in this respect. But uh, uh, church, by coming to church, you can be saved from the influence of, in the elements of the outside world, uh, the sinful behaviors of, of other people. We come here to encourage each other and to isolate ourselves from the world and be attentive to the things of God and to the Word of God. And that, in effect, can save a person from some awfully destructive habits and, 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 and things that, that we can get caught up into in this world. But that's, I'm not saying that you go to heaven by going to church. I'm not suggesting that at all. But you can use the term salvation. Salvation can happen to us in, on many different levels and in many different ways. Uh, but when we're talking about eternal life, when we're talking about being born again, when we're talking about those kinds of things, we're talking about justification. Now, Jesus said, uh, was very clear on how this happens. Uh, this happens when you believe in Him. That's what the Scripture tells us. That's what it tells us in, the, in John 3 and 16. Uh, that whosoever believed in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Um, that's what, uh, when it was questioned him, what do I do to do the works of God? And he said, believe on the one that he has sent. Uh, that's what he told uh, 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 Mary and Martha about eternal life, uh, was that uh, anyone that believes in him, though he would die, yet shall he live. But it's always rooted and grounded in belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you believe in him, you receive salvation. You receive justification. You receive redemption. You receive eternal life. And that's how that is brought. Now, it comes to us. It's, the, the Scripture tells us it's by grace through faith. And it's a gift of God. So it comes to us. It's not, I want to say, free of charge. But it's free of charge to you and to me. It was a high price. It cost a lot. It cost the life of God's Son on the cross to shed His blood on our behalf. So there was a very, very high price paid for it. But it comes at no cost to you because the Bible calls it a gift. So He, he gives this to you. It's, uh, it's done in grace. It's done through faith. Uh, this, the, this gift. And that's how it comes to you. But when Jesus starts talking about building your house on the solid rock, when He starts talking about carrying the cross and following Him, it, He uses language that's quite a bit different. And people often confuse the two and think that He's telling the way of salvation when he, uh, or, or the way of eternal life uh, when He's not. And here it's no different. Here He speaks of discipleship. Uh, he speaks of what we call sanctification, which is a process. And some people are more sanctified than others. But it doesn't speak to whether or not they'll be in glory when, when, when they die. It doesn't speak to whether or not we'll be in heaven with the Lord when we die. It speaks to our conduct and behavior here, uh, but not to our justification. You don't want to separate these things so much so, though, however, to the point to where uh, you think that um, that uh, they're 
should be or doesn't necessarily have to be any evidence of faith or a changed life in a, in, in, in a person. That's the thing about salvation. We're saved by grace through faith, but God does a work in the heart of that individual. And they're, 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 you should see a change. You should, should see repentance. And you should see uh, something different going on in their life. But, um, so we don't want to separate them, separate them so much so as to say that repeat this prayer after me and then go live however you want and you're good. Uh, that's, uh, I wouldn't dare suggest that to anybody. But it's also necessary to understand that justification, eternal life, comes one way. And that's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it comes to us by His grace. Uh, you know, when Jesus says something, uh, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to eternal life, Jesus' message is, come unto me. Come unto me. To me. That's what He said. Now when He talks about discipleship or sanctification, He says, come after me. Follow me. Do what I'm doing. But He doesn't say do what I'm doing in order to get eternal life. He's, he tells us to do that because that's the good and the proper thing to do. That's, that's how you are blessed. That's how you build your house on the solid foundation. When you do what Jesus does and when you follow His teachings and when you uh, uh, adhere to, uh, to uh, the things that He's saying, it's like building your house on a rock so that when the storms come and they do come, your house is still standing. Whereas on the sand, uh, on the shifting sand, when the rains come and the winds blow, your house comes crashing down. Uh, it's not. It doesn't speak to sal It doesn't speak to eternal life. It speaks to sanctification, and it speaks to this life here and now and how we live it and what it looks like. Well, what does it look like to uh, deny yourself? It says, if any man will come after me, if any, in other words, if any man will follow me, he just told him that he's going to have to be slain and raised the third day. He says, if, and, and, and if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Uh, for whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. It's not talking about eternal life. He's talking about your life here and now. Um, the, uh, I was reading uh, uh, Harry Ironside's commentaries on these, and I, I don't remember the exact quote, but he was uh, sharing uh, about when he first uh, uh, believed the gospel, when he was first saved, and uh, how, he, how his life had changed, and the things he once enjoyed, the things he once wanted to do, he no longer wanted to do those anymore, and he, he, uh, he wanted to change in his life, and that was indicative in, in his behavior. And his friends, his uh, uh, he said that many times they would even make fun of him uh, for his faith. And sometimes, at least one of them on one occasion, would say that, why, are you, why did you do this? You threw your life away. You know, and they're, they're lamenting that he threw away all the good times and all the fun times, and they're thinking that he's involved in this Christianity now, and he's, he's thrown that all away. But what he, his response was, yes. I did throw it all away. That was what I fully intend to do, and I hope to throw away more of it. Because this is what I'm told to do by my Master. If Jesus is my Lord, He's my Master, and I want to do what He tells me to do, and this is what He says to do. But uh, we, have a great, we have great examples of how not to do this. Uh, we see it in the Scriptures. We'll see it uh, uh, in this very chapter. But... Uh, what did Peter do? He denied the Lord. He didn't deny himself. He denied the Lord. He did it three times. And, and you think about what he did, what he said when they said, hey, I know you. You, 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 uh, you want his followers, don't you? I, I don't know what you're talking about. And then another would come and say, hey, weren't you with him? I don't even know this man. You know, and, and things of that nature. He was denying the Lord. He wasn't denying himself. He was denying the Lord. And that's what that looks like. So if we, when, when we see what denying the Lord looks like, then we can know what denying ourselves looks like. And, and, and uh, uh, 
and exalting the Lord. That's when you say, I do know Him. Let me tell you about Him. Let me tell you how He has changed my life. And let me tell you how He has helped me and how He has made me a new person. And how He has helped me to throw that old life away that I once had and embrace the new life that He now gives me in Him. You know, that's, that's, what, it, that's what it means to deny yourself. Uh, to and 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 uh, it's to give up on that old old life. The people that try to save their life, uh, we're in First Samuel on Wednesday nights, and it's amazing to me how Saul is such a great example of someone trying to save their life. Saul knew that the kingdom had been given to David, and he does everything in his power to hold on to that throne, even though God has determined. I'm taking it away from you. Even though the prophet of God, Samuel, had told him, the kingdom is no longer yours. I'm taking it and giving it to another man. Saul's solution is kill the other man. That way I can keep it. And Saul was went through, like David ran for his life for around 10 years, living in caves and caverns and living in hiding for his life. Uh, Saul, on the other hand, uh, was uh, trying to preserve his position, preserve his life as he knew it. And he would believe and get to thinking and, and believe rumors that David was laying in wait to kill him and to overthrow him. And David had no desire to overthrow him and to take the throne in that way. He had no desire to do it. But Saul would be convinced that David was out to get him, that David was out to kill him. Do you know who killed Saul? Saul. Saul killed himself. Isn't it, 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 isn't that the way that it happens, though? Whenever you go away from God, whenever you depart from Him and, and, and d d depart from His words and from His will, the very thing that you try to save is the very thing you end up taking. Uh, it's so much better, it's so much easier if we just surrender to the Lord and just say, Lord, not my will, but Thine be done. And uh, it's easier said than done, uh, Mind you, uh, I think we all understand that full well. Uh, but he, but he's, he uses just plain, simple reason. What, what is a man advantaged if he gained the whole world and lose himself? What, what advantage is it if a person gains all of his dreams and everything that he thinks that he wants, but in the process loses his own soul? That's not a very good trade. Um, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and his fathers and of the holy angels. Now he speaks about his return, when he returns to set up his kingdom, when he returns as the king. He says, I don't want to be ashamed of you. And if, but if you're ashamed of me and my words, that's what's going to happen. I'll be ashamed of you. And then he, he speaks a little bit about that kingdom. And says, I tell you the truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they sing the kingdom of God. And I'm amazed at the amount of the number of people that wonder on that passage and say, does that mean that the, that the apostles would still be alive today? Because the kingdom of God still hasn't come yet, at least uh, uh, as we understand it. And uh, some might even use this to... Uh, to spread doubt or, or to cast doubt on, on, on things in God's plan. But and we understand in verse uh, 28 uh, exactly what he's talking about when we see what happens. He says this, that some of you standing here is going to see the kingdom of God with your eyes. He's, that's what he means uh, 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 before you die. And so, and this is what happens next in verse 28. And it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. Again, Jesus is going somewhere to a secluded place to pray. And he's going there to commune with his father. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and blistering. And behold, uh, there talked with him two men which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory. Isn't that what he said? Uh, that uh, 
uh, if you're ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory. And then he says, some of you are going to see this before it's all over. And as he's praying, it says that uh, he, his countenance became white and glistening. And behold, uh, they're taught with two men, Moses and Elias, were taught with two major, major prophets. Uh, and uh, Moses was not just a prophet. Uh, he was also the, the, the leader of the nation at one point uh, who uh, appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So they're there on this mountain. Jesus is transformed before their eyes uh, and, into a different shape, a different figure, a different uh, uh, state of being, it would seem. And, he see, and they see with him Elijah and Moses talking with him and they're talking about the resurrection. But this also tells us a number of other things too, but uh, of which are, why were the disciples so shocked and amazed when Jesus was crucified? Not only did he tell them about it a number of times, he told them what he was going to do. They, at least three of them heard him discuss it with two people that have long since passed, Moses and Elijah. Uh, this also tells us another thing. How did they know who Moses and Elijah was? Uh, it doesn't say that they wore name tags that, you know, they could tell. And I believe that in glory, we're going to know who everybody is. We're just going to know. It would appear that way here. Uh, that Jesus didn't speak to them and explain to them who this is before Peter got his ideas about what to do about it. Peter knew it was Moses and Elijah. Nobody told him. He knew it when he saw who it was. Uh, this gives us a hint, I believe, with the way it's going to be in glory. Uh, we're going to know each other. We're going to know our loved ones. And we're going to know the people that we never even met that lived before that we'll be able to recognize them just as they recognized Moses and Elijah. It says that they spoke about his decease, his death, and what he should accomplish at Jerusalem. It says, but Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. Now, all that means is that Peter wasn't thinking when he was speaking. Uh, he was just speaking. His mind was in neutral. And he made a suggestion that, that wasn't really a, a great suggestion. Uh, and that was that he would... Uh, he said, it's good that we saw this. It's good that we got to see this because now we're going to build uh, some shrines for y'all. We're going to build one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. We understand that, that he really didn't know what to say about what he had seen. So he figured he would say this. And it says that while he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them. And they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone and they kept it close uh, and, and told no man in those days uh, any of those things which they had seen. So in those days, they didn't communicate this affair, what happened. But it's interesting that um, Peter probably thought he was doing the right thing. Uh, but we oftentimes, just like Peter, uh, confuse our own will with God's. And it's something that we desire to do, but somehow we attach God's will to it and think, well, this would be a good thing for the Lord. I'm doing this for the Lord. In reality, you're not doing it for the Lord. You're doing it for yourself. Uh, and this is what Peter was doing with this suggestion. It sounded like he was doing a great thing or wanted to do a great thing for the Lord, but it's something that the Lord didn't ask for and didn't even want. Um, but the Lord let him know exactly what he wanted from him to do, exactly what he wanted to take from this experience. Um, the, he needed not be impressed with the fact that Moses was there or that Elijah was there or that they were talking. Uh, what God the Father brought his attention to was his son. And he said, this 
It's my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen, hear him. Uh, he even adds the words we understand from the other gospels, in whom I am well pleased. I am highly, highly pleased with my son. And I want you to listen to him, hear him. And this actually harkens back to the very, you know, the lessons that we had over the seed and the sower. Uh, this is how faith is, it, it begins as the message that's being sown and it takes root in an individual and, and grows and produces fruit. Uh, this too is the same, same way, really. Uh, what he's telling them is to listen to my son, hear him, pay attention to what my son is saying. Peter was, was more concerned about what do I need to do about what I'm seeing? Uh, what can I do? Uh, for, he might even been thinking, I'm going to do this for God's glory. I'm going to do this for the Lord. People have come up with all kinds of schemes and ideas of things they're going to do for the Lord, and the Lord might not be anywhere in it. But even if He is in it, even if it was a good idea to, to uh, revere uh, Moses and Elijah and, and the fact that they saw this on that mountain, Peter wanted to make a memorial for the whole affair. Here stood Elijah, and here stood Moses, and here stood Jesus. Come up here and see this spot where they all stood. And God is saying, no. God the Father says, no, don't do that. This is my son. I want you to listen to him. And the same, the same instruction should be obeyed by everybody for all time. It's, and, and, and be understood that what we're talking about is Jesus, the son of God. And it doesn't matter what rumors we hear about him. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about him. But what matters is what you think about him and how you respond to him. And God the Father is in heaven declaring, this is my son, hear him. Believe in what he's saying. Do what he's saying. And you can't go wrong with that message. Uh, everything else falls into place whenever you find that Jesus is the most precious thing to you in all this world. And, and, and all the other things, even though they might matter, even though they're good things, they take their proper place in the whole scheme of things when Jesus is the most precious to you. And when we pay attention, we don't have Him here bodily. We can't see Him on this mountain. And we can't see that glory. And we don't see the things uh, with our eyes. But we hear it. And that's what God the Father was declaring from heaven. It was so important for them to do. That's the message that He gave to them people at that moment in time was this is my Son and I am highly pleased with Him. I want you to listen to Him. And that's the message that goes out through all the ages is to hear Him. This is God's Son. You won't find any greater advice. There's a lot of people in this world that give good advice. Uh, there's a lot of people that I like to listen to, and I, they, 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 you know, they say things that are like, "Wow, that's good." But you know, there is no person on this earth that can give you any better advice than the Lord Jesus Christ. And 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 what He says is to believe in Him, and what God the Father says from heaven is to believe in Him, hear Him. That's the testimony and and and, and the works that Jesus did that came through the Holy Spirit. That's the same message that comes through his, his uh, deeds was to believe in Him. He is worthy of our trust. He is worthy of our, of our confidence. He is worthy of our adoration, our love. He is worthy of it all. And that's the main reason why we should give it. It's not because of what we think um, uh, we might do or might accomplish. It has nothing to do with any of that. It has everything to do with elevating God's Son to the point in your life where He is your Lord and He is your Master and you're going to listen to Him and you're going to pay attention to what He says and do what He says. Uh, there's nothing in this world more important than that. That's what should be taken away from the Mount of Transfiguration. Is, this is my beloved Son. Hear Him. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we're grateful uh, for this time together and we pray, Father, that you would help us to uh, be mindful of these events and these things that took place all those years ago. Uh, we know that that message is just as important today as it was then. 
that we need to listen to your beloved son. And I pray, Father, that you'd help each one of us to uh, that know him, to help us to trust in him more and help us to believe in him more. If anybody's hearing this message today that hasn't ever trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation and believed in him, I pray that they would do so. And Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand.